Good morning, good morning, everyone. If you're joining us online and you're tuning in in the afternoon or in the evening, hello, hello to you. We are so glad you're joining and tuning in into the church service and you're spending your time, your Sunday with your spiritual family. We are excited to see you today. And we are really excited about one more thing. It's our new series starts today. Uh, it's the series on the Matthew 5, on the Sermon on the Mount. And I specifically want to talk to you about that. If you don't, I don't know if you're aware, but every Sunday, our elders, whoever preaches on that Sunday, they develop a small group study guide. This is that thing that I have in my hand. And today is the first one. Look at this beautiful design. Uh, look at the beautiful. You can ask me later who designs those things. It's not me, but it would be quite surprising to you. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that sermon guide is developed by uh, our elders or our pastors for every sermon that we do on Sundays. And uh, you can... The, the goal of this sermon guide is to go deep into what we learn on a Sundays. And we encourage our small groups to go through that guide or in their studies, but we also encourage every single one member uh, to use it as a devotional. And actually this week we, d we develop spe special questions for your quiet time. Uh, so you can go through that guide and you can uh, go deeper in the world. And I would tell you, this, this is very special time. This is very special guide. This is very special, unique resource that we develop just for our church community. We develop just for our members and we, we, we put our heart in it, uh, but also we ask specific questions for, for, that reflect how we as expat uh, live our life here in Beijing. And yeah, you, where, you can ask me, where can you get this guide? It's on our website. If you go to bicf.org slash citychurch slash small groups, uh, you can have all the guides available there, but also our newest guides there. You can download it, you can read through that, uh, you can use it for your, again, for your personal devotional time with the Lord, but also you can get together with friends. If, if you don't have a small group, uh, we do encourage to join you to join the small groups, but if you ha don't have one, you can also get together with friends. For example, when you meet uh, with friends at the coffee shop or for lunch or for dinner, you can use that resource uh, to ask questions. Hey, I remember you've said in a church last Sunday, do you remember what the pastor was talking about? Here are the few questions. Instead of just maybe talking about something uh, you can ask those questions at the dinner for example one of the one of the questions uh, this week it says read Matthew 5 3 to 4 nothing the verb tense of the second part of the verse in what ways is the kingdom blessing both present and future and why it is important to understand that's quite a deep question you know and uh, you can talk with it with your children at, at the dinner time uh, family time you can talk with, it with your friends from the church so yeah the, the discipleship actually could happen anytime and anywhere you go so we hope you really would enjoy that and if you have more questions about the guide or about small groups uh, you can join, uh, you can email us, citychurch at bicf.org. Uh, we hope it would be a blessing, this resource to you. And before we start, make sure you get a cup of coffee. If you're watching us online, uh, make sure get comfortable and uh, let's pray uh, for the service. Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much for this last October Sunday that we can spend together as a spiritual family, that we can uh, just go and be with you that we can learn from you and Lord I just pray that uh, you would prepare our hearts as we come in together and to worship you and uh, learn deeper your word Lord God whatever you have for us as a community whatever you have for us as a church Father God please bless us and yeah in your name we pray Amen
Well, good morning. Happy Sunday. How's everyone doing today? Good. Welcome to City Church. Why don't we stand together? We're here to worship our God, to meet with the Lord, and to fellowship with one another. So let's just open our hearts and prepare ourselves for everything the Lord has for us, and let's raise a hallelujah. It's a word that we often sing, but sometimes we don't think about what it means. It's an ancient word. It simply means praise the Lord. So let's praise the Lord together. sing together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes to fight for me.
rise up. We say thank you, Lord. You are so good to us. Yeah, use your own words to tell the Lord how grateful you are for his love, for his faithfulness, for the cross that he bore all of our sin, our shame, that he's raised us to new life, that he's adopted us into his family. We celebrate today, Lord Jesus, your goodness, your faithfulness to us. We worship you, Jesus. Receive all the glory and honor. One more time, sing, I raise. I raise a hallelujah. I raise it up. I raise a hallelujah. And I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Sing what a gift of grace. What a gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no
you for your grace and mercy in sending Jesus to be our Redeemer. And such great uh, love, such great gift of grace, we can never thank you enough. And the power of the name of Jesus brought us light and life to this dark and corrupted world. And he brought joy um, to our presence and the hope to our future. And uh, we pray today that you will Lead us and guide us and then help us to walk in your light and in carrying this, this joy that Jesus brought us. And uh, yeah, just spread the joy of the world. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So good to be with you all this Sunday morning. Um, we're going to continue our worship, but this time through the act of giving. Thanks, Pastor. Yeah, so we're going to continue our worship through the act of giving uh, this morning. Uh, as we prepare our hearts for giving, just want to just give thanks to the Lord. Um, just this week, we were able, as a church, through your generous giving, to be able to to give away ninety two thousand RMB for missions in South Africa. So, yeah, we just we we pray for continued opportunities, continued um, kind of partnership with the churches uh, in South Africa, and actually they're a hub to lots of places throughout the the the, the continent of Africa. And so, pray for that the the Holy Spirit would continue to, to work and move among the people there. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we give you praise because you are the cornerstone and you are our hope and our salvation and there is no other salvation in any other name except you. And we give you praise because you have opened our eyes to the beauty of the gospel You've called us to yourself. And Lord, we pray for our service today that it would be honoring to you, that we would give you the praise that's due your name, your holy name, that, that we would be serious about giving you honor and worship and, and reflecting your glory, not just here in this room, but as we leave this place today and be salt and light in the world. We pray that you would continue to speak to us and continue to receive our offerings to you through, through monetary means, but also through the words we say, through the time that we give, through the, the gifts of the spirits that we use for your name's sake. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. City Church, my name is Nastya and I'm your MC today and I'm so excited to spend my Sunday with my spiritual family. You guys, we are one body of Christ, we are the church, we are brothers and sisters and yeah, seeing each one of your faces brings me so much joy. Welcome also online people who are joining us online, let's not forget about them as well. And this is an exciting Sunday because we are starting a new series. Uh, Pastor TJ is going to start us off really well. But it's also exciting 
uh, weekend for me personally because tomorrow is one of the our Christian tradition holiday. Anyone knows what's what's day is it tomorrow? What are we celebrating tomorrow? Yeah, Daniel knows. Okay, Daniel. No, it's Reformation Day, right? Reformation Day. You guys, if you don't know what's Reformation Day, please go back and Google because I have like two minutes to tell you what's happening tomorrow. Why is it exciting for me? Because I think because of the Reformation Day, I am able to read the Bible in my own language. If we don't know, like in the 16th century when it happened, before that people were trying to translate Bibles. It was illegal to translate Bibles into l local languages. They were only using it in Latin, right? But after Reformation happened, it exceeded the process of translation. And I'm here standing as a, again, the testimony of being able to read the Bible in my native language, right? And I, I think it blesses uh, people who are non-believers. You know, when they don't believe and they, they read the word of God. They read of the, every time they hear the word of God, it touches the heart. There is something that changes them. But also as believers, you guys, I know that this word changes you daily. As you read the Bible, it changes, transforms you. It's, it's, yeah, it's a process of sanctification. So I'm just thankful that uh, this, this holiday that happens, this, this event that happened 505 years ago, it still impacts me and it will impact everyone till the word of God will be preached to the end of the verse. Amen? Okay, uh, good to see you here. And I have a few announcements with you. The first one is member meeting. It's happening today after this service at 12 12.10. We would encourage you to stay here and attend. And you would say, oh, it's, it's probably a boring meeting when the board comes and they say the report. Guys, I want to give you a different perspective. Think about it as a family. We are the church. We are the family. When Think about it as like family reunion. <laughs> When you come to your family reunion, we are celebrating. We are celebrating what the Lord is doing in this church, what the Lord is doing in the family through different um, ministries. And you are able actually to hear, you are able to ask different questions. And I know some of you, oh, I don't want to know those things. Maybe it's too much for me. But there are so many things to celebrate. We're just not able to say to you, to communicate to you on a Sunday. So you're all welcome to uh, join. It's only... Uh, 45 minutes you can still catch up for the lunch or even order it lunch here you know you can it could be here so please attend members meeting another good event is happening for married women anybody you anybody married women i know we have a lot <laughs> there is the our speakers lined up and they're really gonna talk about really great topics i just open a small uh, door for you like the topics of how to be an empty nester when your child left for university or the topic what are the face dynamic in the marriage so if you have not uh, bought your ticket please buy your ticket if you're a married woman come to today this afternoon at 4 p.m uh, if you're thinking about oh i have children i don't know child care pastor tj always in uh, welcome to take care of your children <laughs> but seriously seriously the lord will provide okay just it's a really good event when all the married women coming together and growing together in the lord City Church is the church from the city, of the city, and for the city. And being part from the city means that the Lord might call you to a different location. Is there anyone who is living in Beijing or living in China? We would love to acknowledge you. We would love to pray with you. Anybody here in the room whose last Sunday is today? Uh, anybody? Anybody online? If you're online, uh, please let us know and our online team would pray for you, with you. But nobody in the room, right? Okay, great, guys. See you all next week. On the other side, is there anybody new, anybody who's first time here visiting? We would like to acknowledge you. We would not ask you, please raise your hand because we have... Welcome, welcome, welcome. You just need to raise your hand. You don't need to say anything. Uh, the ushers are giving you coupons. We, If you go to the hub at the end of the service, we will give you this beautiful City Church branded Mac. But also, we want to take you out for lunch. The lunch will be on us. So if you can't make it today, we can do it next week. But please make sure to go to the hub. The hub 
hub is the place where connections are happening and community is happening. So yes, welcome, welcome. Now, guys, there are two minutes of fellowship. And uh, I really hope we can use it, not just to waste it. And I want to encourage you, go deep in those two minutes. And you're like, what? I can't like share my whole life or my deep things. But it's just the first step when you start, when you say, hi, my name is... And you can ask, let's go back to the Bible. What, what are you reading recently? Which book of the Bible you're re reading and what the Lord telling you through that, through that book? What I'm trying to tell you, get connected with your family around us. This is your brothers and sisters. We are all family. Even if, we, if I don't know your name, when I, I, I don't remember your face, but we are all spiritual family here in Beijing. Two minutes on the clock, go. Morning. Morning, City Church. Morning. Wow, everybody's up and lively this morning. That's great to see. Great to see. Uh, my name's Brett, and I'm here to share uh, an update for our Gospel Conversations initiative. And for those of you who don't know, we have an initiative in our church that we aim to have a thousand Gospel Conversations. That's a thousand conversations with unbelievers about the gospel, and we plan to do a thousand of those in the city. So I just want to read some scripture to you just to encourage you this morning. I want to read from you Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 to about 11. This is kind of Jesus just getting ready to ascend into heaven. And um, starting in verse 4, it says, And being assembled together... With them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will at this time you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea and in Samaria and to the end, ends of the earth. And now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up into a cloud and received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, 
who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Wow. You know, Jesus thought it was a better idea for him to go up into heaven. Rather than stay and build a physical kingdom, he thought it was a better thing to go up and send the Holy Spirit to empower you and me to go and share the gospel. He thought that was a more effective thing. Wow, that's humbling, right? (laughs) And not only that, I love the, the two angels, the two men in white apparel, the warning that they give is don't just stand gazing. Don't just stand gazing. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. So the Holy Spirit's come now. (laughs) We don't have to wait for any more so we can go and we can share the gospel with those around us. I want to give you a practical challenge because that can be overwhelming sometimes, right? That Jesus would choose (laughs) to use us rather than stay around. Um, But the practical thing is, you know, we are studying or or looking, studying a Bible in our um, growth leadership team at the moment. And one of the questions that I just want to challenge you to ask somebody this week is, are you a spiritual person? You know, and just, and just listen to them. Listen to what they say. I think quite often we don't do that. We want to get our cards on the table, right? So just ask, you know, somebody this week, are you a spiritual person? Or, you know, what spiritual beliefs do you have? And I just want to challenge you to ask that question. Also just want to, um, we have 409 conversations registered. Just want to encourage you to register every conversation, even if it's with the same person, because otherwise we're not going to get any registrations because we're all just talking to the same people, right? So I want to just remind you to register conversations and not people, right, Uh, with all that. But yeah, so um, there's the challenge. Let's go out, let's, let's respond and let's actually listen to people's responses. Another thing we like to do is, is pray for the nations. So one of our church congregation is going to lead us in a prayer for Morocco now. Good morning, church family. Thank you for joining us today. Today we are going to pray for the country of Morocco. Morocco is located in Northern Africa, and it has a population of 36,561,813 people. It is predominantly a Muslim country, and close to 100% of the population is unreached. As we pray for the country of Morocco, we can pray for the evangelistic materials to be spread among the unreached people groups so that they can hear the gospel and come and know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We can also pray for those who are troubled by the increasing tensions between the Islamists and the moderates to be open to hearing the good news so that they can truly find peace. And lastly, we can pray for the believers in Morocco to be able to have fellowship and those believers who are isolated to have freedom from fear. So please join me as we pray for the country of Morocco. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here together today in your name. Lord, I pray for the people in Morocco, Lord. I pray that the gospel will be spread, that you will raise up laborers to take the evangelistic materials to the unreached people groups in Morocco. I pray for the people who are troubled by uh, the tensions that are rising between the different people groups in Morocco. 
I pray that you open their hearts and their minds and their ears, Lord, to the hearing of the good news, Lord, so that they can come to know you as Lord and Savior and that they can find peace, Lord. And I pray for your people, Lord, the believers in Morocco. I pray for their safety and your protection over them and that you give them peace and calm any fears that they have, Lord. And I pray that you protect their fellowship, that you provide a place for them to have fellowship and that your hand is over their gatherings, Lord. Any believer who is isolated, Lord, I pray that you lead them to a fellowship and again, that you take away any fear that they have, Lord, and give them freedom from fear. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revive you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God bless the reading of his word. Can you guys hear me? Is it on? All right, great. Uh, 1961, New York, uh, there's a museum that uh, displayed a, a new series of arts. It's actually the last works of arts by Matisse. Uh, here's a photo of one of the pieces of art that was displayed. Uh, 112,000 people kind of went in over the first 47 days looking at the different types of artwork there. This is one of the ones that they were looking at. And there are art curators, art experts, museum staff, uh, even Matisse's own son went through and, and looked at all of the artwork. Day 47, a lady walks in, sees this piece of art, and goes to the, the security guard and says, you've, you've hung this piece of art upside down. Now, the security guard says, you don't know what's up. You don't know what's down. Neither do we. Of course, you know, as I look at this artwork, I kind of agree with him. Like, how do you know what's up and what's down? There's actually only one way to tell. The artist himself is the only person that can say which way's up and which way's down. Today we begin a new series starting in Matthew 5. It's the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus' Sermon. And in many ways, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus walking into the museum of our life, looking at our worldview and saying, you have hung it upside down. And because Jesus is the author of our world, he's the only one that can tell us which way's up and which way is down. We are born into sin, born with a fallen nature. And the way that we view this world is often through a wrong lens of why the world was created and how we are to interact with God's creation. And so what we want to do today, we want to begin a series of kind of allowing Jesus to retransform our image of the world. 
Uh, here's, you know, if the world wrote the Beatitudes, that's what we just listened to, Jesus' Beatitudes. This is the way the world should function. This is, this is right way up. If the world wrote the Beatitudes, this is probably what it would sound like. Blessed are the gifted and the talented and the intelligent, for their life will be heaven on earth. Uh, blessed are those who turn a blind eye to sin and suffering seeking instead to surround themselves with the pleasure-inducing, pain-numbing narcotics of entertainment, for they will be the happy ones. Blessed are those who put themselves first and fight for their own rights, for they'll find success. Blessed are those whose life mantra is be true to yourself, give in to your desire, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the angry who always look for someone or something to cancel, who never forgives and never forgets, for they shall always have some new cause to defend and some new life to destroy. Blessed are those who say and do all the right things in, the right, in front of the right people, who never get caught in their secret slander, for they will have plenty of friends. Blessed are those who pl- polarize positions and people, for they'll be given the right title and find themselves in the right friend groups. Blessed are those who hide their faith at work, betray their moral values in front of their friends in order to avoid persecution or punishment, for they shall get the praises of men and God. The Sermon on the Mountain is Jesus coming and flipping the script on us to say, actually, this is what life is really about. And today, we begin with the Beatitudes. And it's important to note, it's the Beatitude, the first Beatitude is in verse Three, the last beatitude in verse 10, and they begin and end the same way. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which means everything in between, the first one and the last one, all, all eight beatitudes has something to do with God's kingdom. What is the kingdom of God like? Uh, the most simple definition of the kingdom of God is God's people and God's place under God's rule. And actually, that's what we want to look at today. There's three things I want to pull from the text today. The first thing that I want us to kind of focus in on is the the demands of the kingdom. That's God's rule. And then I want to look at the delights of the kingdom. That's God's place. There's no greater delight in this world to be in the presence of God. And then I want to look at the disciples of the kingdom. That's God's people. God's people and God's place under God's rule. So first, the demands of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, even before we get to the Beatitudes, the beginning of the entire Sermon on the Mount. It says, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up to the mountain, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, I want you to notice the contrast between these two words in these verses here. The crowds and the disciples. And that's intentional there. You know, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he was extremely popular. I mean, for good reason. Like, he'd show up at your party and, like, there's free wine. He'd show up at your picnic and there's free food. He'd show up in your village and there's, like, a free health check. Like, Like, there are a lot of reasons to like Jesus. So crowds flocked to Jesus But let's not confuse the fact that just because you're surrounding Jesus doesn't mean you're a disciple of Jesus. There's a difference between a person who follows Jesus for some secondary reason and a disciple who's willing to give up all to follow Jesus. And so at the very beginning of of this Sermon on the Mount, we're confronted with the question, which group are we in? Are we among the crowd that follow Jesus for for the miracles and the manna when it's simple and easy? Or are we among the disciples that actually will trek up the mountain? Not just in the marketplace where all I have to do is walk out the door, but am I willing to go up the mountain to meet with my Savior? Where all he's offering me up on the mountain, all he's offering is his message, his teachings. Is that enough? For you. That's the mark of a true disciple, the demands of the kingdom, that a true disciple of Jesus Christ is willing not just to follow Jesus when it's easy and convenient, not just for some secondary gift, but they realize a true disciple that Jesus himself is the gift. 
And like Peter and James and John, they're willing to leave everything in order to follow him. The text says that Jesus went up on the mountain to teach. And I think that's intentional. It's, it's the separation of the sheep and the goats. You know, you follow me in the markets, will you follow me up on the mountain? Uh, you follow me when it's easy, will you follow me when it's difficult? And the question is given to us, well, what about us? You know, you know, are we willing to follow Jesus when it requires effort? Are we willing to follow Jesus when it causes us to give up our comforts? Are we willing to follow Jesus when it might cause conflict with friends and family and co-workers? Are we willing to follow Jesus when it might even cost us our very possessions and lives? Listen to Jesus just a few chapters later, Matthew 10. Whoever does not take up his cross, whoever is not willing to die to self, and follow me is not worthy of me. And there you have it. That's the demand of the kingdom, that you follow Jesus. If you come to this sermon, and all you hear are the words, and you don't see the person behind the words, you've missed the sermon. If you come to this sermon, and you think to yourself, oh, you know, here's the secret to happiness. Or, or uh, here's, here's how I can be a good neighbor uh, or, uh, this is really a good business model. If I follow these things, maybe I'll find some success in my business. You completely miss the point of the Sermon on the Mount. You, you have to walk away with this sermon saying, this is teaching me about the God-man, Jesus Christ, who's come down in the flesh to be with his people, to bring us back to God, and I must fall down and worship him. Jesus says some crazy things in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, if you don't obey these words, like, like he speaks at the end, we're going to say he spoke as one with authority because he's demanding something from us. I, I'm reminded of what, what Moses said in Deuteronomy. Moses, Deuteronomy 18, says, The Lord your God will raise up from you a prophet like me among you from your brothers, He's, this is a prophecy of Jesus here. And it says, it is to him you shall listen. And here Jesus is on the mountain. Moses goes up on the mountain to get the law. Jesus is on the mountain to teach the law. And Jesus opens his mouth and speaks. And the words of Moses are echoing in everybody's ears. Are we going to listen to Jesus? Will we be obedient to him his will, his desire. It's his kingdom, not my kingdom. That's the demand of the kingdom. Let's move to the second one, the delight of the kingdom. God's place, because there's delight when we're in the presence of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Every beatitude begins the same way. Blessed, blessed. And then it ends the same way by why, why are you blessed? Well, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Because you'll be comforted. Uh, because you'll be satisfied. I mean, right off, we're confronted with the fact that there is a motivation to pursue the kingdom. That, that there's something good involved for those that follow Jesus. You know, Jesus is not like the mother that's like force feeding her kid vegetables. I, I know you don't like broccoli. I know it's no good. I don't even like broccoli, but eat it because it's good for you. That's not Jesus at all. Like Jesus comes up on the mountain and he's like, look, I've got ice cream for you. Like the kingdom is real. You're going to, you're going to, it's demanding. Yes, but you're going to love everything about the kingdom. The kingdom Blessed, blessed, blessed. He says it eight times. Blessed is the person who comes to me. What Jesus is doing when he says bless, 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 bless is he's speaking to the greatest desire in the human heart. I, I, I don't know many people that wake up in the morning and think, how can I make my life miserable? How, what can I do today to really be sad and unhappy and just just hate life. But I know a lot of people that wake up, whether consciously or not, and their great thought is, what can I do today to be happy? What can I pursue today to find 
joy. We are pleasure seekers. And Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount says, you want joy? There's no greater joy found in me. And God is an anti-joy. I mean, we, we read in the Psalms, Psalm 16, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. A lot of people have this wrong idea that Christianity is anti-joy. All the commandments, don't do this and don't do that. And God is anti-everything fun. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is anti-second-rate imitation joy. It's like you're walking around with a fake Rolex and God's like, that'll never do. Let's take that fake thing off and put the real thing on you. When he says, blessed are, here's the way to real joy. Because the world seeks false joy. They think, oh, money's going to bring me joy or power's going to bring me joy or position's going to be, bring me joy or giving in to my desires or worldly possessions or fleeting pleasures of sin are going to bring me joy. And Jesus says, wait a minute, here's Here's the way to pleasures forevermore. It's not in those things. It's in the person that is giving all good gifts to his people. You know, let's say, I mean, we live in China and sometimes it's hard to, to get some of the stuff from our home country. Let's say that I have like your favorite drink up here. And for me, it'd be a Dr. Pepper. Um, if you're from Australia, maybe it's a, a Bundaberg uh, ginger beer. Or, you know, it's, it's fall, so, so maybe it's a pumpkin spice latte from Starbucks. You have your favorite drink up here. And I say, it's yours, it's free, come get it. Only one caveat, I put some poison in it, and when you drink it, you'll die. <laughs> no matter how wonderful it tastes and how much you've craved it, like if you know to drink this is going to kill you, you wouldn't drink it. And what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount is all of the things that you're seeking after is going to kill you. Why would you drink that stuff? Because there's real true joy found in me. Blessed, blessed, blessed are. So there's a couple of things I need to say about these, this blessing. Because I say blessing is, is a pursuit of joy, but maybe in English, when you hear the word bless, you don't think joy at all. You don't think happiness at all. At, at all. It's because our language has evolved. Uh, the word beatitude is not an English word. It's a Latin word from beatus. And the, the translators, when they came to this Greek word, blessed, they thought, what's the greatest Latin word we can use? Be at us is definitely the greatest word we could use to describe what this word is saying. Do you know what be at us means? It means happy. It means, it means like truly happy. It means to make happy. Because the Greek word itself, blessed, literally means to make happy. But as you read the text, pay attention to the grammar. It's a present, active, right now, happiness. Blessed are. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The great hope of Christianity isn't just something in the future, right? Like life sucks right now. Let's just suffer through it and one day we'll have joy. The promise that Jesus is offering to his followers in the kingdom is right here, right now, the kingdom now. The king now, God now, joy now, pleasures forevermore now. But at the same time, pay attention to the grammar. Because not only is it present, everything in between the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, also uses a future tense. They shall be comforted. They shall be satisfied. One day, in the future. And this is Gerhard Voss. Why, when he describes the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, he says it's the already but not yet kingdom. It's kind of like when you go to a restaurant and you, you order a, a five, seven course meal and the appetizer comes and you know, the appetizer is good. You eat the appetizer. It's great. You, you like it. You not come for the appetizer, right? It's, it's not the thing that you're most looking forward to. It's nice but it's not complete. You want something more. And right now, on earth, there is joy and pleasures to be had with God, but 
It's the appetizer. It's the temptation, the, the, the little tantalizing flavor of what's better to come. So, so it's the already, but it's the not yet because it's joy mixed with sorrow. It's, it's pleasure mixed with pain. It's hope mixed with despair. But one day, they shall, they shall, they shall. Every tear will be wiped away. Every sorrow turned for joy. Every promise of the kingdom fully realized. Those are the promises of the blessings of those that come to Jesus. And now we come to the third point, and we're going to spend the most of our time here because there's, <laughs> there's eight blessings to talk about, eight beatitudes. Uh, we look at the disciples of the kingdom. Now, let me make a few observations before moving on to these eight characteristics. Number one, I think in these eight beatitudes, there's a progression. It, it's, like, it's like a cookbook. You know, when you pull out the recipe of a cookbook, like if you skip a step, it can be disastrous. Like if, if you beat the eggs before you break the eggs, no one wants to eat your cake because there's eggshell all in the cake, right? Like, like you have to follow the order. So in the Beatitudes, there's a natural progression to everything that's being said. For example, like you hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is the fourth Beatitude, because you've already experienced the first Beatitude. You're poor in spirit. You're empty. You long for something. Or, or you're merciful, which is the fifth Beatitude. You're merciful to others because you have already learned to mourn over your own sins that you've committed against them. Why wouldn't you be merciful to them? So there's a progression here. Secondly, there's a unity here. Uh, we shouldn't see these Beatitudes, and some people do, as, well, you know, some Christians are poor in spirit. And then we have the meek Christians. Not, not all Christians are meek, right? There's just some of them. And, and, and then we have the mourning Christians. They're always sad and, you know, talking about their sin. And, and then we've got some other Christians that are like hunger for righteousness. That's the wrong way to view the Beatitudes. This is a whole. This is eight pieces of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. A true follower of Jesus possesses in some capacity all eight of these together. And then thirdly, there is an inward to outward movement in these eight Beatitudes. It's like, like the Ten Commandments. The, the Ten Commandments start with God, how do you love God, and it moves to how to love your neighbor. And so when you, when you look at the first four commandments, they're inward and they relate to God being poor in spirit, mourning over your sins. Uh, uh, and then the, the fourth one, like hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And that naturally, the inward movement that you experience in relation to God naturally flows outward in relation to other people because you've experienced these four things. Now you learn what it means to show mercy to your neighbor. You, you learn what it means to be pure in heart towards your neighbor. You, you learn what it means to, to, to display the inward realities of the kingdom to your neighbor. So, with that in mind, let's look at the eight Beatitudes. When Jesus says, this is the mark of a true disciple. Number one, true followers of Jesus are those who are spiritually bankrupt. 5.3, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the person who has no guanxi with God. They realize that. Blessed is the person who their spiritual bank, bank account is empty. They are in deficit. They are bankrupt to God on account of their sins. And they know it. And that's the key. But the reality is everybody in this room and everybody in the world is poor in spirit. Like We have nothing to offer God. Nothing good to bring to Him. But not everybody is aware of their spiritual condition before God. He says, blessed are those who know that they are poor in spirit. It's, it's the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son? He gets his father's inheritance. He's rich. So what does he do? He leaves his father. He goes off and lives a luxurious, riotous, sinful lifestyle because he's rich. He's enjoying it all. And then one day, 
He spends everything. And a severe famine arises. And he begins to be in need. He's aware of his condition. I have no money left. And then it gets even worse. His need is so severe as a Jew, he has to take a job being a pig farmer. You know how, how, how terrible this would have been for a Jew, an animal that's unclean, and now I have to work for them. And it gets even worse that as he's feeding the pigs, like his, his condition is so bad that he looks at the pods of the pigs that they're eating and says, wow, I, I wish I could eat pig food. And it, the scripture says he comes to his senses and he says to himself, I will arise and go to my father. And it's only when we have spent all of our pride spent all of our self-sufficiency, spent everything that's in us that thinks we're good enough, and we realize we are bankrupt, that we will arise and return to our Father. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. It's the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3. You say, I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing that's rich in spirit. What's the cure? He says, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's the cure. Blessed are the person that realizes that because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, true followers of Jesus are those who hate sin. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I believe this is speaking of mourning over sin, the progression here, that I I know I'm spiritually bankrupt, which moves me to weep and mourn over sin. I, I, I am grieved over the fact that I have fallen way short of the glory of God. Are you like the publican in Luke chapter 18 who stood far off, didn't even want to enter the temple and wouldn't even look to heaven, but, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a person who hates his sin. Are you like Paul in Romans chapter 7 who says, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Are you like Peter in Luke chapter 5 that when he sees Jesus, the beauty and the glory and the holiness of Jesus makes him realize how sinful he is, that he falls down at the feet of Jesus and says, Depart from me because I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Are you like Isaiah in Isaiah 6? It says, woe is me. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips. You see, blessed are those who mourn. isn't just mourning over our own sin. I live among a people of unclean lips. We mourn all sin. It's the psalmist in Psalm 119. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Do you mourn over what you see celebrated on television today? Do you mourn over what you hear sung on the radio stations today in celebration that are so anti the kingdom of heaven? Do you mourn over the sins that you see in your workplace? Do you mourn over the jokes that you hear in the hallways? You walk down the middle school or high school. Do you mourn o- over what you read in the tabloids that's entertainment to the world? Well, did you hear what they did? Do you, do you hear what they're doing? Do you see what they're wearing? Do you mourn like the psalmist? over the sins of the world. Thirdly, true followers of Jesus are those who submit to God's rule. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is a person who comes to God and says, I am not God. You are God. And I will bow to you. And I don't expect you to bow to me. You see, you can, you can come to Jesus empty and broken, but when you hear the demands of Jesus, maybe you don't like what Jesus says, and in your pride you walk away because you're not willing to submit to, to his demands over your life. That's the, the rich man in Luke 18. That's exactly what happened to him. 
He comes to Jesus. He likes Jesus. This is a pretty good idea. But then he hears what Jesus demands of him, and he's not willing to submit to the teaching of Jesus. So he walks away disappointed. It's, it's prideful Pharaoh who knows who God is. He's seen the power of God over and over again, but his own pride keeps him from bowing and saying, you're God and I'm not. In fact, he says the opposite. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That's the opposite of the meek who are in the kingdom of God. Are you willing to say with John, I must decrease and Jesus must increase? Fourthly, the true followers of Jesus are those who long for holiness. Verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, it doesn't say blessed are the righteous. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Remember the first beatitude. The first beatitude is you're poor in spirit. Like, like you've got nothing to create righteousness. You, you know if you're going to be righteous, it's not from you. You're the beggar on the street that, have, that you've got no money in your pockets, but you're longing for bread. And then you know the only way you're going to get bread is if someone with bread comes and has compassion on you and gives you something that you can't buy for yourself. That's the righteousness that we should long for here. It's an alien righteousness. It's not something we can conjure up. It's not something we can work towards. It's not something that we can earn on our own effort. We're poor in spirit. It's the righteousness of God's Son, Jesus Christ, who was completely pleasing to the Father, who is completely willing to give His righteousness to anybody who in faith comes to Him, repents of their sin, and believes that Jesus is who He says He is. That's the righteousness that Jesus speaks of here. I, and I say that's the righteousness because if you go to verse 10, He'll say, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. And then you go to verse 11, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted on, or actually He says you, not those, changes person. He says, blessed are you when you're persecuted on my account. You see what he did there? Righteousness, my account, Jesus says, are the same thing. Me and righteousness are the same thing. There's different types of hunger. There's different types of thirst in the world. You know, there's, there's the type of thirst that like I'm sitting around the house and I'm not, oh, I've not drank anything today. I'm a little thirsty. Let me go get some water. Then there's the type of thirst that like I've been out running for an hour in the hot sun and I come in and I'm parched and I'm like, oh, I really need some water or some Gatorade. And then there's a type of thirst that's like the person who's lost in the desert for three days, the sun beating down upon him, all of the sweat and the precious liquids that are in his body being, being extinguished from him. His mouth is dry, his lip is parched, his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth, and he knows that if he doesn't get water soon, he will die. That's what Jesus speaks of here. Blessed is a person like the man in the desert who knows that if he doesn't get the righteousness of Christ, he dies. It's the righteousness that the psalmist spoke of when he says, I hunger and thirst after you. Like, like a man in a parched land. Those are the inward beatitudes. And the inward beatitudes towards God will always work outwards. And it's not something, as we talk about these next four, it's not something that you work to do. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a gift of a person who's been transformed on the inside by Jesus that's going to automatically work outward to these next four things. True followers of Jesus are those who show compassion. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's not something you work at. It's something that transforms in you through meditating on Jesus and being transformed by Jesus. Forgiven people, forgive. Recipients of mercy extend mercy. So let me ask you just some simple questions. Do you have mercy on those who sin against you? Do you hold grudges? 
do you go to bed at night imagining like how to get revenge on someone else? Do you keep a record of wrong, ready to pull it up in an argument? Do you look at people who've done wrong and gotten caught and punished and think to yourself, Sirs, you're right. Or are you broken? And praying that they would have a lifting of their face like you had a lifting of your face and that they would come to repentance like you came to repentance and that they would receive the mercy of the Lord like you've received the mercy of the Lord. Mercy doesn't come from trying really hard to forgive others. It comes from a person who is abiding in Christ. It's a natural outworking of a true follower of Jesus. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. True followers of Jesus are also those who live with integrity. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And pure in heart in the Bible, Old and New Testament, speaks of two things really. One is uh, integrity in your life, not duplicated, not two-faced. Integrity before God. But it also speaks of integrity before God other people. And I think when when Jesus gave this beatitude, certainly he was referencing Psalm 24. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Listen to Psalm 24. And I want you to notice how pure in heart is surrounded by both of these, the person who walks in integrity before God and a person who walks in integrity before people. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall be found in his holy place? In other words, he's saying, who shall see God? It's the beatitude, shall see God. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands. You're living a life of holiness and integrity before God. But he goes on. What's on the other side of this pure heart? The one who does not lift up his soul to what is false. It's a person that lives truthfully before others in the world, who does not swear deceitfully. I'm not going to slander my friend. I'm not going to give false accusation against my neighbor. A pure heart is a heart that refuses falsehood. It's a, it's a heart that's truthful even when it hurts their own self. It flees deceitfulness. Next, true followers of Jesus are those who bring peace. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Not the peacekeepers, like in the Hunger Games, that enforce peace with brute force. That's a false peace. That's, That's peace on the outside that allows the war of anger and hatred and bitterness to rage on the inside. Blessed are the peacemakers, those that really are pursuing inward reconciliation between peoples. Why? They shall be called sons of God. God is the ultimate peacemaker. God is so committed to peace that he sent his own son to die for us. Jesus is so committed to peace that he gave his life on the cross for us to bring us peace with God and with man. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, my wife went to her school parent-teacher conference or kind of back-to-school night for parents. Uh, She was wearing a mask, you know, because that's what you do in China, right? And and she's walking down the hallway to to see one of uh, Noah's teachers. All you can see are her eyes. And this one teacher comes up to her. She's never met this teacher before. All she can see are her eyes. And she says, you must be Noah's mom. How'd she know? Because he's her son. He bears her marks. He looks like her or acts like her in some way. And what Jesus is getting at here is if if you are a son or daughter of God, you bear the marks of of me. Peacemaking is in your blood. Next, true followers of Jesus are those who suffer for God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I actually 
we preached a whole sermon on this a couple of weeks ago in First Peter. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because I don't have time. Go back and listen to that sermon. But I do want to ask a question. What does this have to do with the other seven Beatitudes? Do you notice how different it is? Like the first seven Beatitudes are like things that you're doing. Like, like, like you're poor in spirit. You're merciful. You're a peacemaker. This one, it doesn't say, blessed are the persecutors. You're not doing anything. You're being done against. Like, where is he going with this? I think this is, this is the, tenth beatitude, uh, the eighth beatitude. Like, this is where he's going. The eighth beatitude, persecution, is the evidence that you've possessed the other seven. Like, persecution comes to you because you've been living a life of a kingdom child in a world that doesn't understand the kingdom. And when you live, when you really live the kingdom, you will be persecuted in some way. Because your, your life is an indictment against unholy living. Like, if you really value, like, sexual purity and you live that way, like, that speaks against the world that revels in sexual immorality. Like, if you really value temperance, that speaks against a world that would love drunkenness. If you really value self-control and you live that way, that speaks against those that love gluttony and convicts them and angers them that you're not joining in those things. And so this last beatitude is a reminder that persecution isn't the blessing, but it's blessed to know that you are living kingdom values in a world that needs the kingdom, which actually leads into next week's sermon. The very next thing that he's going to say is, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And blessed are you because of that. Maybe we could um, go back to that painting that I had at the beginning. Remember this painting? I can't make heads or tails of it. <laughs> I mean, I like art, but not all art. This is, the, I don't even know what it's supposed to be, right? This is a particular kind of artwork. It's, it's called a gouache, whatever that means. The artist actually has this same piece of art done in a different mosaic. It actually puts like flesh and blood on it. We can show that photo. Now all of a sudden it makes sense. It's a sailboat on the sea. Now, if I'm looking at those weird squiggly lines, I, I've got no idea which way it goes. And for most of our lives, most of the people in this world, they look at life and it's just random. It's just squiggly lines. And you can't make sense of life. None of it makes sense. What Jesus does on the Sermon on the Mount is he actually takes those squiggly lines and he begins to paint the real picture behind those squiggly lines so that life makes sense to us. It reminds me of something C.S. Lewis said. I believe in Christianity, or I believe in Jesus Christ, as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And my prayer is that as we spend time in this sermon, life will really for the first time for some of us come clear. What's it about? Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? As we respond to the word of the Lord together through singing and declaring our worship, our prayer team will be coming forward. They have blue lanyards on, and they would love to pray with you. If you have any need, um, don't hesitate, even as we sing. We're going to sing a new song, um, and it, uh, the verses of this song are the Beatitudes. And uh, I hope over the course of this sermon that we can sing it at least a few times 
specifically for the purpose of memorizing, um, committing to memory these eight beatitudes. You know, Scripture talks about hiding His Word in our hearts that we may not sin against God. So as we sing, I just want to give you that challenge, church. Let's, um, let's commit over these next several weeks to try to memorize these beatitudes. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's sing together. Oh. Intro. Let's, let's pause. We'll do it old school.
team up here on my left, on my right, they're wearing blue lanyards. They love to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. So as we end our service today, encourage you to come up here and receive prayer. Um, also another reminder that pretty soon after we end this service in 15 minutes, we'll have our members meeting right here in this room. So I encourage you to stick around for that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we thank you um, that you've come into our world and that you've given us the kingdom and that we fully enjoy it now. Lord, we pray that we can really live intentionally in your kingdom and live in the fullness of it. Not, not in the second rate counterfeit kingdom but in the fullness of what you have in store for us. We pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, as we walk out of this place today to really be salt and light, to really display the fruit of a true disciple, that the world might come to know you and be engrafted into that kingdom. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Come on, pray. Your kingdom, your will be done. Your will be done from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Oh, oh, oh. 